Hello, and welcome to the Cloud Multiplier. Uh, this is episode seven, and your show for all things distributed cloud. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Joy Deep. And today we have three guests to talk about Red Hat Insights, one of the cool, one of, one of the most interesting and, in my opinion, most useful tools I've worked with, kind of just integrated into my OpenShift dashboard and in my ACM dashboard. So thanks for every, thanks to everyone for joining. Um, we'll go ahead and kick off with an around the room of our guests. We'll go in alphabetical order, I think, this time. So Kachi, you get to go first. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us about what you work on, and then we'll uh, go around the room and dive in on some insights. Yep. Sure. I work as part of the Insights team. I'm a senior software engineer, so I will do a short demo of what we do today. So basically, an engineer who found passion for data like four or five years ago. So now we're trying to combine that. Awesome. Uh, we'll go on to Tomash. Do you want to go next? Tell, tell us a little about yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm a product manager for what we call Connected Customer Experience. Insights is the customer-facing brand or product integration that, that you can see in our portals, portals and within, within the products. But awesome. there is way more behind, which is what we're going to talk about today as well. Amazing. And then, uh, Radek, uh, I know we've been playing this for a little while, so uh, go ahead and... Yeah, and finally it's happening. So. Hey everyone, my name is Rade Bukal. Uh, I'm running a small team of product managers uh, that are focused on all things insights around OpenShift. So today we're going to be touching on some of these services, the engineering work behind that, what is happening behind the scenes with the insights. And as Tomasz mentioned, we'll also show you some of the interesting integrations where we are using insights data and we're making data-driven decisions because that's what the talk is about today. Amazing. I, I have seen as I've gone to cloud dot, you know, console dot and, and looked on, on console dot cloud uh, dot redhead dot com. I've gone there and they just new things appear every little uh, every once in a while, new services, new insights. How many are there under the umbrella now? Where what are we at? So there's there's three services right now, but there's a lot of magic happening behind the scenes. So uh you as a customer, you see a portion of that. And we're actually adding new services. So I'm not going to touch on it because this should be another session at some point. But we're okay. going to introduce a new service in about a month. And I would love to present it here as well. Uh, but right now, we're talking about three main services. And we're talking about some of the internal integrations that we have. And again, we'll touch on them and show you what, what is happening and what we're doing. Awesome. That's that is a good framing mechanism there. So so what you're saying is there's a teaser for maybe here in a month or two we might have another stream. There's always more coming, too. right? Awesome. Um, Joy Deep, have anything for the for the opening of the stream? If not, I have a, a good anecdotal uh, piece of evidence about insights from my own life. Uh, I, before you go there, Gurney, I actually have something. Let me send uh, send you the link. Uh, okay. I know control the chat. This is a very interesting um, uh, GitHub repo, which I came across, which allows us to test Kubernetes applications, you know, test whether they're working well, test their SLOs, et cetera, et cetera. This is very fascinating. I want to explore this a little bit more. And I think this might be interesting for us as well. I just happened to chance on this repo. Okay, and this is this is something that that goes against your production service or against your your canary deployments. To, to, I think this is more against the canary deployments to okay. test whether your code is performing, etc. But you know, I'd like to kick the tires and and yeah. see how useful this is. Looks very very interesting. They have GitHub Actions integration, so, yeah. so that makes it that makes it automatically easier to yeah. to integrate with. That's really cool. Okay. It, it looks sure. interesting, and we should probably touch on that as well, because when we start talking about insights, there's there are some open source tools that we're using behind the scenes as well to look at the deployments that you have on your cluster to look at some consistency and compliance even uh, over your cluster. So we'll, we'll touch on that too. Haven't mm -hmm. heard about this one, so thanks, Jody, for the link. We'll take a look at that for sure. 
That is amazing. Okay. Uh, so I, on to my, my morning one is anecdotal. I warned everyone here that I was going to tell my story about uh, insights. So we were running a upgrade, just kind of routine. Well, slightly, slightly more than routine upgrade of one of our clusters from, I think it was four, eight to four, nine. So we were going OCP four, eight, four, nine. I kick off the upgrade. Nothing happens. We're sitting there. The upgrade isn't occurring. I'm like, what is, what is wrong? And then I get an alert that says, Hey, you have, here's a warning. You need to acknowledge that this, you need to acknowledge this warning before you proceed because something bad is going to happen. Mm. And I'm, I'm now immediately over talking to someone in support. And I'm like, I was warned that I'm about to do something very bad to my cluster. And like, yeah, you, it turns out you are. And you should have, you should have actually looked for a second at the release notes before haphazardly doing this. Um, so it's, and not, it's not only you have been warned, but we don't let you shoot yourself in the food. We don't let you do the upgrade because there's something going on with your cluster and you need to resolve that on your exactly. cluster before the upgrade can happen. Yeah, and it was an easy, it even said here is what, if you if you acknowledge this, if you know what you're doing, go ahead and make this command. Everything's good to go. It was very visible. I knew immediately what to do, what doc page to go to. Um, one of our colleagues, Trevor, immediately said, oh, yeah, you've hit this thing. Interesting. Glad insights worked. Um, we would have seen <laughs> you on the other side of the support journey if you had. So that's it. And, and honestly, Garnet, this, this is what I like about insights as well, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I have another anecdotal thing to your thing. I, I recently purchased a, a new drone. And the first thing when I when I started that was it was asking me, do you want to share the usage and analytics data with us? I guess what I checked, right? Like, hell no. Uh, I don't know what you're doing with the data. I'm not going to send you anything. But with Insights, we're actually showing our customers and we're showing even here today what we're doing internally with the data and how it's useful for the product quality, for the support efficiency, and also for some edge cases like you had your issue with your upgrade. So this, this is the cool thing about Insights, that we're very open about what we're doing with that information and how we're bringing it back to you. Yeah, it's those little nudges, those little edge cases where, hey, if we can catch a customer before this easy, this easy to make misconfiguration, this change, we know these things. How can we make sure that a customer knows these without having to go pull our release notes? Turns out if their cluster says, hey, I need help. Here's here's the problem. Here's what's going on. Mm -hmm. I it's um, I, I talked to a customer recently and they said, we're currently doing reactive operations how can we how can we change that reactive operations into proactive we want to be ahead of the issues we want to anticipate them we want to step in we want to do a good job and know know something's going to go wrong before it goes wrong the usual dream of i want to know i want to know about an outage about 10 minutes before it starts um, it is that more. thing and then the other aspect of that is when when you look at the issue that you might hit where a cluster chances are that someone else already had the same problem right. actually we did the analysis internally and we realized that 85 almost 90 percent of the issues that you've had in our cluster we already knew about it we mm -hmm. already seen it happening elsewhere and chances are that we also have a solution for you so that's that's another thing where we basically match the information with our own internal knowledge base, with the experience of our support people, solution architects, even our own SRE team that runs OpenShift for internal services or as a managed offering for our customers. We take that experience and bake it into Insight so you can use it as well. So that's right. amazing. So you are actually you guys are actually consuming the data that we customers would uh, okay customers would send to red hat cloud and and that is a data across thousands of clusters that's deployed and you are being totally transparent on what data you're collecting in fact you know it's it's out there in the github of course and then you are mining that data to find out patterns yeah. and you know if this thing happens then this thing happens etc cetera, etc cetera, and then you're pushing it down as nuggets gems to the customers so that they can see Exactly. Right? exactly. Uh, with, with one thing that we always start with the product first. If the problem can be fixed in the product, we go to the operator, we go to the company and we fix it there. Then uh, if, if we cannot fix it or there's, again, some sort of recommendation, best practices that you're not following as a customer, you might have actually a good reason why you're not doing so, but yeah. we don't recommend it. This is where we tell the customer directly. 
Uh, but again, if it's a product issue, it has a huge impact. And Katya will be showing some examples like that. We go to the product first and we fix it there. Yeah, and, and back to Gurney's anecdote, I can't tell you how many times I have seen on customer systems live, you know, that suggestion that, hey, your Prometheus is not backed up by a PV. Mm -hmm. We recommend you back up. It's written there in the documentation, but people often don't do that. Uh, you know. Anyway, so this is all. This is this is wonderful. Yeah, and yeah, th th this one is interesting, but there are some more serious ones, and I'll, I'll show some examples here, okay. of course, uh, of things that you really have to follow. And keep in mind that a lot of these things are that Insights Advisor, because we're talking about this one component right now, Insights Advisor. Uh, the, one, the thing that the Insights Advisor is doing is it's proactive, right? So a lot of these things are basically telling you if you follow on this path with this configuration, with this setup, you're going to hit an issue with an upgrade, or eventually when something else changes on the cluster, you have a performance scalability issue of some sort. But the important thing is that it's proactive. It's basically telling you, based on our experience, things will get worse if you continue with your setup. And that's why you should absolutely watch this and, and look at the, the problems. The, the one that you Garni brought up with an upgrade, you, that was a great example, right? So the cluster was operational, it was working, but something was blocking the upgrade. Look at the recommendation. The recommendations, majority of them are actionable. So it's going to tell you the exact command line that you should run in your cluster. Go there, fix it. You'll be good to go with your next upgrade. Yep, exactly. And and I know I may have been able to find the right people and get support engaged and fix it if I had just waved my badge and said, I don't care about your insights. I'm going to go ahead and upgrade my cluster. But I know for a fact, if I had pulled our entire fleet up to that new version at the same time, that that is the the multiplier, the scalar factor that make, takes insights from, well, it helps me get out of a bad case in the support ticket once to it gets me out of our entire operations. Is our, our, we're completely down. We're dead in the water. All hundred clusters are gone because we we did this thing that we, we weren't supposed to do. We misconfigured it. We had something wrong. And it's those cases where you don't need to fix one thing. You need to fix 100. And Insights can save that entire fleet. Or the other way around. What is happening quite often is that you have a cluster with hundreds of alerts or 20 plus alerts. Let's, let's go for a lower barrier, right? But the problem is that you don't know the root cause. You don't know what oh. actually causes all these operators, all these components being degraded, firing an alert, because the alerts are usually component focused. Uh, with insights, we're looking at the whole cluster and we're combining these alerts with additional conditions, with additional things that we see on the cluster. And only after that, we're giving you the recommendation. So what, what happens with these recommendations that, again, they are more spot on, they're looking at the root cause. And if you fix these things, all these 20 alerts will suddenly disappear. You don't have to go through them one by one and try to figure out what is happening with this component. It's DNS that is not working because, again, we, we had that experience and we've seen it before. And so, Radek, how real time is this? How frequently do we transmit the data? And how frequently do we analyze and, and have right. the... So we, we use two sources of information here. We use the telemetry data that are continuous. And we use that a lot for the internal analysis. Katya will be talking about it again. But we use Insights Operator, which is a snapshot of additional piece of information that we collect every two hours. And every two hours, you immediately get new recommendations, new results of the analysis. Uh, the reason for that is that we're actually collecting these additional pieces of information that are more static. They don't they don't change that much. And again, we combine it with the more live data, so we can see the different patterns and we can act on them. Okay. Awesome. Radek mentioned one thing, and that, and that is that is the insights operator component. And that component actually does a little bit more than just insights. It's enable it enables your OpenShift clusters with additional functionality like simple content access uh, within within your workloads. Uh, so if you disable insights operator, you're not only disabling insights, but you're disabling also really significant functions that could limit your uh, management abilities when it comes to cloud. Yeah, it's, it's what you asked about, Garni, at the beginning. Insights is a set of services and set of functionality. It's basically our connection to console dot and to Red Hat services. And, and we're using insights as, as a broader term for multiple things, including additional features that you get from Red Hat. And a reminder here as well, uh, all the services that we're talking about, they are free of charge. 
And again, these are value add services that, that we offer to every single OpenShift user. You don't even have to be a Red Hat customer. Just install OpenShift, start using it, and you'll get these services to see what's happening on your cluster. Amazing. So you can tire kick with that trial license that I definitely have nothing on. Um, I've never used that by accident. Um, <laughs> Amazing. I can I can immediately understand why why Katya introduced as an interest in data science and and that connection immediately to insights. Uh, I'm I'm really interested in the huge data problem that you're, you've solved because I've only been a, a bit of a a window shopper when it comes to looking at all of the work you're doing in Cloud Dot and all of the services that live there to make this happen and all those data-driven services. I think you had saw some dashboards early, earlier, so I think you have some data. Do you, you guys want to take it away? Yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. Uh, or, let, let, okay, maybe hold on. I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen first. I'll show okay. what we're talking about from the customer-facing perspective. Mm -hmm. And then we start drilling into more details because it's going to make more sense from, from that angle. All right, so what, uh, I'm, I'm sharing my screen, right? Can, can you actually see it? And there we go. Yep. Perfect, perfect. So just that we know what we're talking about. So uh, Insights is a set of services, again, that you as a customer, you'll find them on consoleredhead.com slash OpenShift. Once you log in here, uh, you'll see Oreo clusters. And you've probably used the hybrid console already because you wanted to install your cluster. You probably obtained the pull secret from this, this UI. Uh, what is interesting here, so this is my demo account. Uh, so don't get too hold to what you see here because some of the clusters are a little bit fake. Uh, but the, what you see here is my list of clusters. I have some clusters that are still connected, that are still active, some that are older ones. And for each of the cluster, I actually have a lot of information that uh, you'll see here. And what we're actually interested in are these things, advi like advisor recommendations, cost breaking down. These are the inside services. So again, these value add free of charge uh, additional services that uh, you'll get with your OpenShift installations. You also find them here under the, under the Red Hat Insights menu. Uh, I already mentioned that there are three main services that we're looking at right now. Uh, Advisor, these are the proactive recommendations that we've just talked about. Subscription management, uh, this is how you manage your subscription of not only your OpenShift clusters, but also what you're running on your cluster and can do some additional magic. And cost management, uh, this is a huge component of insights and we should probably have a dedicated session for this one as well because it has a lot of it, it, it's completely different view on your cluster. It is looking at the cost of your infrastructure, the cost of your different projects. You can do a lot of magic around labeling projects, uh, different cost models, exploring what you're spending for. The interesting thing is that here that w w the, all the data that OpenShift offers you, we can use it in different ways. Proactive support would be one of them, but then you can even use it for additional things like cost management to understand how much you're actually spending on your cluster. Um, I'm going to click real quick here on the overview. This is an important thing for me. Advisor is telling me that I have a set of recommendations here uh, of different criticality and different categories. And I might notice that, okay, so security ones are those that I really care about. So let's quickly look at the security recommendations that are available for my clusters. This gets me to the wow. advisor application here where I can either see all my recommendations available for all of my clusters on this account, or I can browse through my clusters and see the list of recommendations for each one of them. Uh, in this example, I, I filtered across all the clusters all the recommendations that are labeled as, as security. And I can see that this thing, the authentication operator degraded because there's a wrong uh, cluster-wide proxy settings. This sounds like a serious one. So I'm going to look at more details here. I have a lot of information about the, the, the impact and the likelihood of this issue actually impacting uh, my upgrade the performance of the cluster. But I can also go here and see the additional details, including all the clusters uh, that are impacted by this one. And when I look at this cluster, this thing actually gives, gives me uh, detailed information 
about what is actually happening on the cluster, why is the issue present there, or why do we think that this is an issue? Steps to resolve. In this case, uh, it's linked to a knowledge base article. Uh, sometimes you'll find here additional information in OpenShift documentation, like Actually, we do have an additional uh, information here in OpenShift documentation, but quite often, again, you'll find here specific steps how to resolve a problem. Let's look at this another one. This is an interesting one. My infrastructure nodes are not labeled, which means that they won't upgrade. And that's an interesting thing. And probably for some reason, I had a node there that I set up manually, and I didn't label it properly. Insights is telling me that this is the node name, and uh, as a cube admin, I just have to run this command and assign proper later label infrastructure or worker on my node so this uh, node can be recognized by Kubernetes and upgraded with my next upgrade. So again, uh, if it's possible, we always try to give you the specific steps how to resolve the problem. And I believe this is gonna maybe the issue that you hit on your cluster that you might have an issue with one of the workers and because of that, you were not able to upgrade, right? So this, this would be the case where the upgrade won't be allowed uh, because something like this happens here. <clears throat> I can look at all the recommendations here. I can do additional magic, additional filtering. Again, something I, I totally recommend to watch but here's the thing, uh, you probably don't go to console Red Hat com OpenShift every single day, and you don't have to. Uh, the insights recommendations are integrated into OpenShift Web Console. If you open the OpenShift Web Console dashboard or the landing page, you'll find their information about the number of insights recommendations available for your cluster. Similarly, in Advanced Cluster Manager, uh, for all the clusters that you manage through ACM, you'll find information about all the insights recommendations for each individual cluster. And ACM integration is actually much more advanced. You'll find all the details about every single recommendations right within ACM. And similar to this UI, you'll find also the, the remediation steps specific to the cluster. Uh, different might, view, be, uh, might be good to note I, I I always find this amazing. This isn't just your this isn't your standard, and this is kudos to everyone here. This isn't your standard uh, AWS Cost Explorer or your you know AWS alerts or your GCP alerts. This is something that exists across clouds and on premises. So that's been amazing. Is the same control plane service, the same visibility, the same insights and you can see for your vSphere cluster and your bare metal and your AWS cluster, as long as they're connected to cloud. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And for all of those, you're getting specific recommendations, right? Be yeah. It, you're a customer of, of the Azure Red Hat OpenShift, right? You will get specific guidance for that particular flavor of OpenShift and all these recommendations associated. If you're a customer of different platform that is Red Hat supported, you will get it as well. And you will get it in all of the UIs that, that you are potentially utilizing, not only the console.redhat.com. Yeah, and Tomas, I was just thinking about that, you know, this when we get alerts, and I, I'm not I'm not bad mounting alerts. We all know alerts are critically important, are very much needed. But here I am being flagged there is a problem. The person, the body who is flagging the problem knows why I have the problem. They're giving the reason, they're educating me and telling me how to solve it. What mm -hmm. more? And I'm showing here a specific example of what Tomaj was mentioning. So if you're, for example, running OpenShift on VMware, uh, this tool has additional information that are coming from the VMware plugin, the provider. And based on that, we can bring up additional recommendations that are more related to the underlying infrastructure. Uh, so again, a great example here with uh, some VMware issue that uh, appear here. Okay. Radek, one question. A lot of our customers also use Ansible, right? That's the nature of the beast. So has there been any thoughts, talks to, I have a recommendation, do I also have a playbook which I can run perhaps to automatically remediate for where it makes sense? Um, there has been a talk, but no work done so far. And the thing is that um, it's it's probably for a longer discussion, uh, but the, the real thing is that we need to be sure that uh, if we provide some recommendation and we want to deploy it with Ansible or some other way, uh, we want to make sure that uh, 
the, the dynamic environment of Kubernetes and OpenShift won't change this, won't interact this, uh, or, or won't somehow impact this. Uh, so we haven't really figured out a good way how to do this. Uh, I actually hope that uh, our integration with ACM will go in the direction where we, uh, some of these recommendations can be directly deployed on the cluster. Would that be through some policy or Ansible? Uh, we haven't chosen the mechanism yet. Yeah. All right, uh, and again, uh, additional services, including cost management, including subscription. I'm just gonna really quickly show cost management. Uh, this is where I was telling you that uh, we have a different view on the same data. Uh, I can look at each project, each namespace in my clusters, uh, how much it's costing me. I can look across my clusters on which of these clusters on which platform are the most expensive. The cost models are directly picked up from the public cloud APIs, or I can create my own cost model if I'm running OpenShift on-prem, and uh, I can do additional magic around that. I think the most cool thing is that I can look at the projects uh, that are running on my clusters, and I can see some information about how much does the project cost, uh, is how much is it's requesting uh, CPUs and, and memory, how much what's the utilization there. And uh, I can actually do this across the project. I can look at some historical data, some trends, and things like that. Again, this is for a much longer session, and hopefully we'll do one of those uh, at some point. But I'm going to hand it over to Katya right now, because one thing that I mentioned at the beginning is that this is uh, the work that we're sh or showing the features or, or services that we're uh, letting customers to basically look at the data that we collect in different ways. But internally, a lot of really interesting things are happening with the data. And they are exposed to engineering. They are exposed to support people in an anonymized and aggregated way. Uh, but we can make some interesting decisions based on that. So Katya, I'll hand it to you right now. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk about what we actually do with that data internally. As Radik was mentioning, like his example with the drone, a lot of applications, when you install them, they ask you, do you want to send the data to some nameless company? And now, uh, after work with that data for some years, I see the value and how it can be used for actually betterment of the product. And what I really like is when the company is really transparent with what they're going to do with the data. So uh, one of the initiatives that we did was we're getting a lot of health data from the clusters. Uh, we uh, can get the alerts. We can see how the cluster operators are doing. Um, we can see if certain insights rules are hitting or not. And we know what versions those clusters are running. So we can actually try and check if uh, we release a newer version, if a certain uh, alert starts hitting more often than it was before. So we actually do anomaly detection on each of those signals that we're getting. So uh, for alerts, uh, operator conditions when they're failing, like when they're progressing for too long, when they're not available, degraded, and for insights uh, rules hits, we're calling them symptom. So that's just, uh, so we create a data set out of it. And after that, we aggregate the data, we dice and slice it, and we do anomaly detection, and it, it runs every day on the latest data. And what happens afterward, uh, whenever an anomaly de is detected, it would send us a Slack message with um, information about an issue detected. So we've been running it for, I think, a little bit over a year. So we were able to... Uh, get rid of false positive. So right now, the notification that we're getting mostly indicates problem uh, either in the product or an alert is flapping or the definition is too broad. So usually whenever we get such a recommendation, there is something for us to do about it. So I'm going to share now. Yeah, and keep keep in mind that we're running this for our all testing servers, for sorry, clusters for our testing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So again, a lot of these issues are uh, related to our testing and CI infrastructure, and, and they are spotted before they get to real customers. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of notification that's actually from today. We recently released 4.11. So we're getting all the interesting things uh, that come with the new release. 
Uh, the one I wanted to talk about was from last Friday. So you can see, so we see the name of the symptom. So there is an alert happening in OpenShift DNS namespace, uh, the name of the alert. We can see um, how many clusters were hitting that problem. If, if they're still hitting it, how many customers are affected? Because we caught, for example, that one customer can have like 20 clusters. So if we see that 20 clusters of the same customers are hitting, that's probably not the product's issue. So it's... Uh, we receive a message, we start talking uh, and pulling the owners of that component. So we start a discussion, we file a new bug, or we improve the detection, or we improve the data. So this is where the discussion is started. Oh, I'm going to sh stop sharing this and share. And you can see there were 42 replies. So the discussions get really lively. Engineering <clears throat> is usually immediately <clears throat> acting on this. Because as Katya said, our, our mechanisms got much better over the time. So they already know that if we spot something, it is a problem mm -hmm. that they need to act on. Yeah. So this, uh, whenever, so notification has some information, but usually we need to pull more, like uh, if a specific platform is affected, if a specific installer is a problem, what are the other uh, symptoms, alerts, operator conditions, and so on are happening on the same cluster. So we have like an RCA uh, notebook uh, in this case. So for the same alert that you saw a notification there in Slack, we see that it was hitting on 4.11. And we can see, so this is uh, if it was, if the clusters affected were installed by UPI, IEPI, uh, Hive, assisted installer, and which platforms are affected. So here we see that uh, AWS clusters installed by Hive are affected, disproportionately affected. Uh, so it's on the, the it map is relative. So something red means that it's a bigger problem. So in this case, it was, we have managed fleet. So that was a specific uh, issue with the uh, managed fleet. We can see uh, how many uh, our clusters are hitting the problem, how many are upgraded versus just installed, what are the other issues we're seeing in the same clusters. So usually when you see a daemon set stuck, that means it cannot be rolled out properly. We also see that mis uh, they are misscheduled. So uh, that graph I would say is a bit boring. So uh, quite common alert. Uh, is not clock, not synchronizing. So that's when on the nodes, crony is not configured. So there is a time drift and you can see, so hit rate here is in percentage. So that's how many of the clusters on a specific version are hitting, uh, firing that alert. You can see that it's kind of all over the place because that means there is no real um, dependency per OpenShift version. That means it's a configuration issue. So we can see that. Hmm? Sorry, Karika, what are the green vertical lines here? That's the, so whenever we detect a spike, this is the green line, that's when we send the notification. Okay. So uh, here, the blue one is the signal that we're getting from the clusters. Uh, based on that, so the, like most of the data science model that get successful in production, it's 10% science, 90% engineering. So the modeling behind that is quite simple. So based on the data, we calculate the rolling mean of the last 10 data points, and we calculate this is the standard deviation from that mean. So this is the threshold where we would detect, de detect an issue. So if we see an outlier, that's two, right now it's two standard deviations above the mean, we would detect that issue. Okay. So that's why this one is detected and this one is detected. Another thing you could ask why these are not detected. These are quite all issues. So we are searching for issues, for problems in the last five uh, Z versions, that is uh, micro versions. <clears throat> so that's basically how the detection look from the inside. So whenever something is detected, we get a message in Slack, we can fire up this more detailed investigation, check which, uh, if there is some pattern on uh, which clusters are affected. We also had a uh, notification for uh, 4.11, the latest version that was actually happening. Uh, it was ingress related. Uh, 
and it was hitting only on cloud platforms, mostly AWS, Nutanix, and so on. So that was basically caused by um, ingress not being configured correctly and cloud credentials were also failing. So the installation of OpenShift itself was successful, but the workloads were not working properly because ingre ingress was misconfigured. <clears throat> And you can see the uh, issues happening at the same time. The, the another quite common one is uh, issues, problems with etcd. Basically, etcd is the database that it gets access through Kube API. So if there are issues with etcd, you will definitely see that. And again, we see a choppy graph because there are no bugs in the product that depend on the version, but it's a quite common issue. Uh, the graph in this case is not really interested, but for example, if we check what are the core occurring alerts, symptoms for the same issue, usually if it's a DSLO, we would have problems with um, accessing Cube API. So whenever it's a D, this alert is hitting, we would also see Cube API error budget burn. Usually it starts happening like half an hour or an hour after this one starts. And we can also see that at least on half of the clusters where SCD is being too slow to respond, we also have that uh, an alert that control plane is uh, quite overloaded. So all of them are related. By looking at what are the other issues happening on the same clusters, we can more or less see if it's an uh, infrastructure issue, if it's specific deployment procedure or that the customers would use. Uh, and so on. So can I pause here for a pause you for a minute? So you said that this is common, right? And mm -hmm. have, we, have we found out what are the reasons why this happens? I mean, is there a direct rule for this reflected somewhere or this just investigation we are enriching? Uh, we're trying to, so with this investigation, we always try to understand if it's the customer infrastructure issue or a product one. So yeah. by looking at the co-occurring things at the graph, so when there is an actual bug in the product, we would see it's kind of flat, and then yeah. it's like we see a quite pronounced spike. So we detect it early and we address it. So basically this is um, the last line of defense, I would say. So we have... Uh, whenever we release a new version, we do. We have unit tests, we have integration tests, we have quality assurance folks doing the testing. And then after it's released, we are monitoring how the clusters that are uh, being installed or upgraded are behaving. If, you, if we see something out of the ordinary, we can spot it before hopefully the customers detect it themselves. So the problem wow. is... Hmm? No, thank you. Yeah, so uh, we catch so we don't catch a lot with this detection but it's a good thing that means the product is of a really good quality because uh you can't catch everything during quality assurance because we run on a lot of different hypervisors we run bare metal we run in the cloud we have different installers different types of deployments and so on so we cannot uh test all of the possible combinations we had a really fun uh bug uh, a couple of months ago found through this. It was if a cluster started in like 4.1, then it was upgraded through each uh, minor version. And if it had some specific feature enabled uh, in one of the cluster operators, then it would hit a very specific bug. So we cannot find those issues through QA because the way to reproduce is a bit obscure, but we would see that through this mechanism. That's amazing. And then what you were showing here also is a really interesting point where you can use the insights you, you get to see a symptom and then track follow on symptoms or track other correlated behaviors and eventually build a pattern that like what you just said, build a pattern or build an exception case or try to figure out why only these clusters were affected. And that's that data where, you know, you, a customer, doesn't have to have one or 20 clusters to try try to retry it and produce an error. We can say, yes. you've had this problem, 12, 12 other people that seem to have a similar configuration based on our insights, or this one flag have this problem, and actually diagnose and resolve that issue at a product level for you without the customer having to bang their head against a wall for a while. That's amazing. And I'm going to comment real quick on, on the tool of choice here, Jupiter. 
because uh, this this is what I like about what Katya is showing. Because if if you actually are suspecting certain thing on your cluster based on these symptoms, with Jupiter you can you can drill deeper, right? You, you can look at specific things. Katya was showing the cloud platforms here, but if we're looking at let's say networking issue, we want to look at the distribution of network plugins as an example, right? Or distribution of specific configuration. So this is where, again, like by drilling deeper into these components and into these symptoms, using a tool like Jupyter, you can eventually find the root cause and, and the single configuration related to 4.1 installation back in the days, right? Uh, this is where you have really had to go into the data and, and use a tool like this to find it out. Yeah, indulge my curiosity. What does the data volume look like for throughput and what we have warehouse? Like, like what is what is this Jupiter? Is this sitting atop hundreds of terabytes of data, or is this sitting sitting atop you know a few terabytes of aggregated insights? This is a highly processed data. So we have the archives, then they get processed. So the archives are uploaded to Kafka, then they're processed. We extract some information, then we create daily aggregations. Then we filter out some clusters that, for example, we, for this analysis, we filter out clusters that didn't finish the installation successfully. So in the end, it's like the more you clean the data, the better data the data is so basically we get less false positive so with this i would say it's the final data uh, that goes into these dashboard this rca would be a couple of gigabytes probably if not less yeah bear in uh, mind uh, that insights operator archive on its own isn't isn't a large data data package right it's roughly 200 kilobytes that you're sending every every two hours unlike the mass getter archive which contains all the pieces of data and everything that's that's required by our support staff when debugging quite complex issues these mass getter archives can can be even in gigabytes or something like that you know so yeah, and I have to comment here on one thing. Data privacy and data security are really important to us. And this is the reason why we never store uh, the raw archives. Uh, we aggregate information as much as possible and uh, don't allow individuals to look at your specific cluster and all the history to data. And the yeah, notebook so I was showing, this was basically for uh, debugging those notifications in Slack, but we also have uh, dashboards in our tool of choice superset, which is open source, uh, where we can look at the same symptom, so see some more graphs, and here, so that detection is based on uh, OpenShift version, so we want to catch new bugs in newer OpenShift versions, but on this dashboard, what I also find useful is we have the hit rate timeline, so sometimes we see that certain problems uh, start uh, hitting on a specific date and then a couple of days it goes down. We had that when uh, for, uh, I, th I don't remember what was the name of the alert, but for example, there was an issue with OCM. So none of the clusters were able to upload things to OCM. So we saw a specific alert spiking up like this after we detected the issue it was addressed so it was going down again so usually for the um, aggregation by version we would see it kind of flat here why i find this graph really interesting so you see uh, this is for the same uh, node clock not synchronizing so basically the clusters um, the nodes on those clusters don't have crony configured properly so uh, they need to configure ntp so what we see here is this is the last 30 days so we see that 4.8, 4.9, 4.10 behaving so quite flat. That means there is no time relation, but we see 4.11 just appearing out of nowhere, spiking, and then going down. So what that means is uh, this was, I think, August 10th. Maybe someone can correct me. That was the GA for 4.11. Uh, for Basically, a lot of Cluster, a lot of customers started installing it, checking it out. And at that point, that were mostly dev and staging clusters. They didn't care about configuring NTP on uh, workers. So we see higher than usual occurrence of uh, nodes not having NTP server configured. And then it goes down once we get more production like and more cared for clusters. 
Well, that's incredible. And this is, I assume, data as well that that helps support when when you have this huge spike in cases, you can give those insights. Or even, I can I can see this as an early warning system for support, probably as well. You might have a handful of customers appear with this issue, right off the bat. Yeah, for support, we have more dashboards. So uh, we have. Uh, so this is basically a graph. I pick specifically kind of sick cluster with a lot of issues. So these are all of the alerts happening on this cluster in the last 30 days. And you can see the timeline. So we see here, hope it's, I can try to make it bigger. E, let's see if precising worked properly. properly. Yeah. So uh, uh, we see that at some point at the end of July, there were some issues with ingress. Uh, Mm, I think there were also issues with, uh, I think, image registry, but I'm not sure where it is. So you can see that uh, cluster operator conditions, you see that image registry is not available, it's still installing, uh, it's degraded. So you can actually see how the alerts you have are correlated with the uh, cluster operator uh, conditions and the support tools as well. So this is basic information that support folks can use to have a like overview of the cluster. So if everything goes sideways, who are you going to call Reddit support, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Katya, I guess this, this is end of your part. So yep. Tomash uh, is going to really quickly show what happens yeah. when I'm you going have to, to open a support case. Yeah. I'm really, really going to fly fast and do, do a review for you, right? So Radek showed you the Insights Advisor. I'm picking on a specific broken testing cluster over here, which in the internal tooling looks like this. There's a lot of symptoms, a lot of alerts that's going on within the cluster. Uh, but if you as a customer want to do something with the cluster and you forget about all the integrations that, that we've showed you before, when you're going into the portal and you're opening a support case, you can fill or actually you are recommended to fill in the cluster ID of the cluster that you're filing uh, the support case against. And at that point, we will already show you the distilled insights information as well, right? So in the support portal itself, you will get the guidance that you need in order to, to alleviate that problem. Now, as Radek mentioned, we sort of follow the 80-20% rule, right? 20% is what we are daring to basically display you directly that is distilled into these concrete uh, instructions that you need to need to follow in order to remediate your cluster. But internally, we make the other 80% uh, which are more debugging related or analysis related available to support at real time baked into our support tooling so that whenever you're filing your issue and you fill in your cluster id in the in the support case uh form uh support can directly act against those problems even if you do not upload any musker archives or anything like that they will get access to the important data uh, from from the cluster related to the work that we do Okay, and then I assume if the user goes here and sees, here are my issues, here's the resolution, we'll hope that they'll say, here, I have my fix, I fixed my issue, awesome. If it's not- I, I, Either that or what we've seen a couple of times happening is uh, a customer opens a support case, doesn't give us enough information, but because we have the cluster ID, we have all the internal reports and yeah. the second comment, we're telling the customer, Go fix this because that's the, your problem. That's the root cause. That is awesome. Yeah, that, that is right. Awesome. Especially, yeah. especially if it's configuration issues. Our mm -hmm. our uh, tooling that we provide to support basically points the direct line in the YAML file that needs to be fixed. You know, and that that we basically need to copy and paste to our customer and say, hey, that's it. This is this is what you need to fix. That's amazing. I have a couple of friends who work in support, not at Red Hat, and they've had tons of headaches about. I need to spend two days collecting customer information. The customer is so angry that I've had them run, you know, 10 or 15 commands and try 10 things. So the fact that we can say, here's the, here's what you need to run. I still need to open a support ticket, open a support ticket. And the support engineer is allowed, to, you know, able to see hear what our insights say. Here's the information that we're, we're able to tell you very quickly how to solve your problem. 
And that's 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 actual hours saved of a customer's engineer. I think that's that's just amazing that a customer gets a solution in twice the time or some some metric. Folks, this has been amazing. We're gonna have to have a follow up. I know there's some more deep dive on cost and then whatever other thing that once I end the stream, Rada can tell it's me about. Soon, right. <laughs> um, the exciting, the, so we'll, we'll go ahead and tease that. Thanks everyone for coming to the show. Uh, the show archive will be up as always. We'll be back next week with the show on search. So it's gonna be the search that's an ACM, it's open source uh, going towards the open cluster management project, a really cool tool around search. And then we'll be back hopefully in another week or two with some more insights discussions about updates and then hopefully have Reddick back on and team a little bit later. So thanks everyone for coming. I'm going to go ahead and play the intro as our outro and we'll see everyone in two weeks. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for